We're grateful to have Johnny Dukes with us, president of Oak Hill College. He'll be helping us think through that very real issue of decision making. I know it's come up quite a lot in the conference so far, but we're going to really drill into the practicalities of decision making in a godly way. Well, let me add my welcome to you also. And let's begin in prayer. Christian ministry begins with prayer. Lord of the harvest, we're grateful that everyone we ever meet is made by you and belongs to you. And we ask you to, that you will help us to see the world the way Jesus sees it, and to love the world the way Jesus loves, and to give ourselves away as Jesus gave himself away. And we ask for the honour of his name. Amen. A couple of things to say about the sort of shape of what we're going to do. We're going to start each of our sections of this time together in prayer, and then we'll turn to God's word. And in a moment, I'm going to turn to the verse from which I've just prayed and which was on the video we saw just now. Then we'll think about some of the dynamics of decision making. One of my aims in our time together is, is if I can, to, to help you to think about the way you currently make decisions and to see what's the same and what's different about this decision uh, that you might be facing as you think about your next step. We're going to, get, going to have a spotlight on women thinking of going into ministry uh, in one way or another. Uh, in our churches, we sometimes forget that more than half the planet is, uh, is female. So we want to focus on, on the decisions that women particularly face together. And then I want to, if I can, serve you well by being a signpost to a whole series of other resources, and I'll show you as we go along where they might lead us. So let me begin then, having prayed with God's word, and read that uh, verse, the two verses, in which the phrase at the heart of the video just now was uh, taken from. So Luke chapter 10, verse 1, very early public ministry of Jesus. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him, to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. All through my childhood, I remember driving with my father around the uh, farm to see what kind of harvest was there going to be uh, in the months that uh, lay ahead, looking for uh, weeds or other kind of damage to the crops. And this thought from the Lord Jesus Christ is extraordinarily stark, and striking, and encouraging. In verse 2, he says, the harvest is plentiful. And as we pray just now, do you see what Jesus sees? Which is that the harvest is plentiful. And do you see what Jesus knows in that same verse? That the harvest is plentiful, he says. And do you see what Jesus promises? In that same verse, the harvest is plentiful, he says. We can easily see what he says next, which is that the workers are few. And no doubt that was true when uh, he first said it. They could see that just as easily then. 72 or so was a tiny number to send out into all the world for a huge task. It's always been true everywhere that it feels as if the workers are few when set alongside the scale of the harvest. We're going to need the whole church to reach the whole world. That's for sure. But you see what Jesus says by way of response. He says, ask. And the word is a really strong one. It means plead, implore, forcefully, repeatedly. Ask the Lord of the harvest. And what we used to ask him to do? To send out laborers into that harvest field. It's clear that from the vocabulary, they weren't necessarily involved. They must be sent, not sent by the minister, not sent because they've had their arm twisted, but sent by the Lord of the harvest in answer to prayer. If you like, a sense of non-negotiable divine insistent, comp consistence, compulsion, conviction in answer to prayer. Now, I know that you, you know this, but I want to start by saying here's the first decision. Will you do as Jesus says? And persistently and repeatedly as the pattern of your life, whether you're a fairly new Christian or you've been at it for a while, Will you do what he says that all Christians are to do? And this is very early in his training of Christians. Will you ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers and then see what happens? He might send you. He might send someone else. 
What I want to do now for a moment is to think with you about decision making and to offer you just a chance to listen to Daryl Williamson, who gives some really seasoned and sensible advice. Let's spend two minutes with Daryl Williamson. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting dilemma. Uh, should I use my gifts in a secular context or should I, should I pursue a vocational ministry, gospel ministry? And uh, to be clear, it's a very difficult thing to discern. It, it's not very straightforward. And I think, I think we're tempted to make that decision based on giftedness. If the person uh, has um, um, the giftedness to, to teach or they have an affinity for the word and uh, that perhaps they should be pursuing gospel ministry. Um, and I think the other thing even, that very often, sometimes early in ministry, those who are gifted, those gifts have not flowered yet. They have not developed yet. And I think it's possible to be uh, discriminatory against uh, a gospel ministry calling. Uh, but the thing I look for is where's the passion? And I'm not talking about just the interest. I think, I think there are a lot of people who can look at, um, say, a John Piper preaching or a Tim Keller teaching and think, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I don't think that's the indicator. My question is, is do you have a true burden and heart for God's people and a yearning desire to see them grow? I think it begins there. I think the Lord does something in the hearts of those that he's calling to vocational ministry. And just because you um, have an interest or ability to do something secular, uh, does not mean that you should do that. And I think the inverse is also true. And so when I talk with the folks in our church, there are lots of young people in our ministry, I try to get a sense as to where their heart is, believing that if there's real conviction and a burden for people uh, and their growth in Christ, that is probably a sign, may not be proof, but a sign that the Spirit of God is leading them to devote their lives to that. And, uh, and so I also encourage uh, our young people to not have any anxiety over it. Don't feel like you got to get it right the first time. There's no time to waste, but there's no reason to rush. And, uh, and I've learned that the Lord is sovereign. Uh, he tends to get his man or woman, depending on the nature of the ministry. And, uh, and so, but I think following your heart uh, and marrying that to your gifts is always a good, that's a good pattern to follow. Later on, go back and watch that again. So sensible. N no reason to rush, no time to waste. Very sensible wisdom from another part of the world, from a seasoned Christian leader. One of the ways in which we make this kind of decision is to listen to other voices other than our own, as well as seeking to work out what God is doing in stirring up our own hearts and the desires that he's giving us. One of the things that we'll do in this time together is move in our mind's eye from, if you like, ordinary decision making in other areas of life and see whether the principles that apply there also apply here as we think about what feels like a much bigger decision and what the way forward for us might be personally. And I want to focus for the first time on um, a, a woman making a decision, talking about a decision, talking to other women about the decisions that she has experienced to making. Let's listen to Megan Hill. For a couple of minutes. For most of us, I think the decisions are not between an obviously bad thing and an obviously good thing. Usually it's sort of a, something that's good in some ways and another thing that might be good in other ways. And um, I think the first thing is, you know, to come to the Lord in an attitude of submissiveness uh, in a, and also in confidence that he's sovereign and that he works and that it's, it, it's incumbent on me to be wise and it's incumbent on me to study God's word and to, to make the best decision that I can, but I'm not going to mess up God and I'm not going to foil his plans and it's not, I'm not going to miss out on something because I chose a different decision. Um, so I think to be encouraged in that, not to be fearful of decision making. And then I think God's people can be so helpful in that and the wisdom of older women, the wisdom of the elders and 
leaders in your church, the wisdom of your pastor, the wisdom of a friend, somebody else who has been through many decisions in their lives and can help you and maybe see the, the whole picture and give some direction of what to them seems good. And to, you know, the Lord promises that there's blessing in seeking wise counselors. And I think we can have confidence in that as well. Lord, I submitted to you. I trust your sovereignty. I considered this prayerfully and I sought wise counsel and this is the best that I can do. And I'm going to do it knowing that you will be pleased with that and that you will bring your glory somehow through this decision. You're not going to mess up God. I love the way she put that, didn't you? And again, may I encourage you later to go back and listen to her again, whether a woman or a man. Uh, in seeking counsel from others, it seems to me that uh, Titus has a lot to offer on that, that we need to look out to listen to the mothers of the church and the grandmothers of the church, the grandfathers of the church. They've seen people trying to make decisions like the one that's facing us before, and they have much to offer us and much help to provide for us as we pray and seek to discern. As part of good decision making, let's make sure that there's a range of voices from different generations within God's people, uh, as well as our own voice and those who are the same age as, as us trying to help us. So that was our first spotlight. I, I promised then at the beginning that I was going to try and be a kind of signpost for you to other kinds of resources. And the one I want to point you to now is a voice from the States. And uh, the voice here is Robert Smith Jr. I think you'll enjoy him as I have in putting this together for you. So we'll head off there and listen to him as a sample of the kind of resources I want to signpost for you. I try not to steer um, young people either way. Uh, I want to provide them with the ministry of presence because I, re I really believe that no Christian has a job. Every Christian has a ministry. I'm convicted by those words in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, that these persecuted Christians who fled from Jerusalem, they were scattered, and everywhere they scattered, they scattered the word. And so I believe that's true with every Christian, that if we're in a vocational context, we don't have a job, we have a ministry. If we are bakers, we are there ultimately not just to bake bread, but to tell people about the bread of life. If we are geologists, we're not there just to sell diamonds on rings, but to tell people about the pearl of great price. We don't have jobs, we have ministries. And yet sometimes those vocational jobs will prepare us for ministry. Moses served as a shepherd in Midian, even though he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, born in royalty, going to the best schools in Egypt. And yet God used those 40 years in Midian when he served as a shepherd for a 40-year ministry in leading Israel. His vocational ministry prepared him for his spiritual ministry of leadership in leading people. And so I keep that principle in mind. Young man, young woman, you don't have a job, you have a ministry. And you may start with a vocational job, but know that even on that vocational job, God has called you to ministry, to represent him in that context. Well, again, go back and listen to him again. Much seasoned wisdom, uh, in my view, from him. I'm turning over the page of our, our handout now onto the uh, s second resource for this particular part of our session. And a conversation, 25 minutes of conversation between three uh, Christian leaders, seasoned Christian leaders, I think mainly from a Pentecostal background, speaking in the States and handling some of these issues around calling. What do you do with a sense of calling? It's a great conversation, well worth the time to listen to it. I'm going to pause there now. We're going to come to some of your questions now for a few moments, and then we'll go on to our next session together. Thank you, Johnny. Um, yeah, a couple have come in here. Great that you're considering uh, women in this area. You, you mentioned that they are half the planet. Um, it's a bit strange that we don't talk more about um, 
women's ministry in every area. I don't know if you want to just say anything more on that. That's obviously something that you've been thinking about a fair bit. God has given gifts to women as well as men. It may seem a very obvious thing to say. Uh, I, I fear that sometimes in our churches we focus more uh, prominently on the gifts that, God, gifts that God has given to men. And therefore, we, we lose sight of the wonderful gifts God has given to women, whether those are um, relational gifts, whether they are uh, intellectual gifts, whether they are uh, gifts in terms of um, walking alongside people, encouraging people. Uh, it seems to me it's time we took a, took, took a much clearer view of the gifts God has given and how can immersing women in God's word together uh, alongside men uh, enable those gifts to be released and developed for deployment in the church and beyond the church in the world. Thanks. Um, another question, I think linking into the first video from Dow that we saw um, about our passion. He was talking about our, our following our hearts. And uh, I think an honest question that uh, what if I don't really know what my biggest passion is? What if I don't actually feel anything hugely strongly or, or all at a similar level? You know, some of us are feel our passions very you know we're very conscious of them others are sort of perhaps the emotional register is a bit lower I don't know if you want to kind of um, speak to that I think it's a good question I think probably it's important not to confuse if you like different kinds of personality with a deep-seated spiritual priority and passion perhaps I could say stay where you are until it becomes clear that you can't if I can put it that way around that if there's something that stirs you from where you are, if God's mm -hmm. called you where you are, stay where you are until you are stirred to move somewhere else. That might be a clue to what's really moving you. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a couple that I think you might come on to later, but um, someone mentions, um, Alex mentions about Kevin DeYoung's Just Do Something, which we um, heard uh, promoted earlier. Uh, really helpfully taught me not to consider God's will as like a tightrope we can easily slip off. As Megan says, we submit ourselves to God, trust his sovereignty and seek wise counsel, very useful. Um, another one that's just come in from, from uh, Dougal. If the calling to full-time ministry is evident in various ways, how does one work out timing? I know looking for opportunities, uh, but, but does one pursue opportunities or wait for the Lord to open doors? So do we kind of actively push on doors or do we, yeah, this sort of issue of timing? bit of each, <laughs> in the sense that it can't always in every situation be right to push on a door uh, persistently, door after door being shut. Uh, on the other hand, to do nothing uh, is not in every situation going to be right afterwards. I go back to the wise counsel, take that question, a good question, a right question, to whatever wise counsel you have available to you, and then work out with them in your context, with your character and your situation in life, what the next step might look like. Great. There's a few about sort of secular versus uh, full-time ministry, but maybe we could take those a bit later. So sure. I'll hand back to you. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. Well, again, let's pray together. And I want to pray about the attractiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious attractiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the way in which Scripture pictures for us people drawn to him and gathered around him. Thank you for pictures of women and men and serving alongside each other and flourishing together as they are each drawn to Jesus. And we ask that our churches may uh, reflect that same attractiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for the honour of his name. Amen. So if you're following on the handout, we're moving to the second section of this, and I've called this And Many Others, which is a quotation from Luke chapter 8. We've got a wonderful picture very early again, even earlier than the last passage in the ministry of Jesus, of a crowd of people, men and women, gathered to him, serving alongside each other around him. So I want to read to you from uh, Luke chapter 8 and verse 1. After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. So male leadership, firmly established, identified, appointed. 
and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So let me just say this is very early in the ministry of Jesus, and something was happening that everybody for, for always remembered, made sure Luke knew, and he chose to put this into his gospel with God's spirit guiding him. Twelve of there, but there's an extraordinary range of women who have been reached. I just want us to notice this, who are then glad to be with Jesus and deployed by Jesus. So you can see there are people who have been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Now, I guess she'd been having a terrible time. The demons had been destroying her in one way or another. They had been reducing her, destroying her humanity, degrading her. Um, she, she had like, been dragged down by the demonic possession from which Jesus had released her. But then, in a sense, right at the other end of the social ladder at the time, there is Joanna, the wife of Chusa, manager of uh, Herod's household. And I take it that these, if you like, two sample-named women picture the extraordinary range of women who were drawn to Jesus, from those who had been, if you like, the most dragged down, from those who were in positions of high social status, and they were all drawn to Jesus, and many others without names. And, and the language sets them alongside the Twelve in sharing in the ministry. And this is not just, if you like, taking responsibility for a catering or writing checks. It's a much broader, more vivid picture of their involvement in ministry drawn to Jesus. As we start there again, I just want to, to notice that that's a bit of a way from the culture in some Christian communities that, that I come across from time to time. So let's just see there's something that is magnetic about Jesus, both to women and to men, in a, in a very proper and beautiful way that by the Spirit of God, it would be right to seek in our churches and as you make the kind of decision that you're needing to make uh, soon. So then let me uh, come back to thinking about decision-making. <clears throat> and I want to offer you, if you like, three metaphorical worlds for thinking about the sort of decision that you might be facing. You can see I've asked the question, what's the task? And therefore, if that's the task, what's the team? And if that's the task and that might be the team, what might my role in the team look like? A fairly familiar metaphorical world of thinking about full-time Bible teaching, pastoral, evangelistic, apologetic ministry is the world of GPs, general practitioners. So people who are trained to be medics of a particular kind. I think that is a helpful model in a variety of ways. It reminds us that training it needs to be serious because the task is serious. I, if I've got something wrong with me, don't want to go and see a GP um, who, who doesn't know what GPs need to know. She might kill me if I went to see somebody like that. So it's a reminder that training does need to be commensurate with the seriousness of the responsibilities. It takes 15 years to train a GP, and it's relatively uh, speaking front-loaded. There is such a thing as knowledge that GPs need to gain, but then it's obviously repeated. No one thinks that front-loading is enough there needs to be persistent, repeat, renewed training for the rest of the G GP's active ministry. But it's a bit of a static metaphorical world. It implies that people will come uh, and then we will do what we can to serve them. But it's helpful in a number of ways. A different metaphorical world would be to think about what happens in the world of education. Come with me into a primary school and who do you see serving in different ways and different roles in a primary school? There'd be a, a classroom teaching assistant, a classroom teacher, a, a subject specialist, head of department. There might be deputy heads, turnaround heads, uh, heads of multi-site schools. There might be teacher trainers. There might be specialists of other kinds. Now, that's a richer metaphorical world than the land of GPs, although there is variety between GPs. What is helpful about that model, I think, is to recognize that for different sorts of roles that people are going to take on, at least initially, different training pathways might prove to be appropriate and different levels of investment uh, in the training uh, for the different role that is in view at the end of the training. So a TA, a teaching assistant, might one day turn into a head of multiple schools. But the sort of training to be a teaching assistant would be different 
from the kind of training that would be appropriate for somebody who is going to take on several schools as their initial responsibility. Still a bit static, though, because children generally go to where schools are. A third metaphorical sort of world in which to think, think and is illustrated on the picture there, is what does a disaster relief team need? And if you think of the world in which we find ourselves as in some ways um, subject to spiritual disaster, what does relief look like? What does a relief team look like? There'll be a whole variety of different roles on a team like that. Massive numbers of different roles will be required. It won't just be one person with a series of other people helping them do their thing. There'll be a whole load of people who are each of them critical in different ways, depending on the disaster, depending on the context, depending on what's gone before and what the urgent needs are of the hour. That, I think, is also helpful to recognise that women and men together in disaster relief teams serve in a whole variety of ways in order to move forwards from what's gone wrong to what might come next. So that was just something on thinking about decision making, recognising that what role you think you might take on will definitely work back into the kind of pathway that will prepare you for it. And it's valuable to have a variety of different metaphorical worlds to think about that uh, and to catch a sense of what you have already uh, got in your mind and well, offer other roles to go alongside that. Now let me focus in, if I may, for a couple of minutes on women training for ministry as well as for men. And you'll see that I've put a couple of different uh, resources. I found it very helpful to listen to these three Christian women talking to each other about decision-making. And they range across a, 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 a number of decisions, some smaller, some larger, some which seem to have lasting, lifelong consequences with very clear boundaries, like marriage, for example, but also some less, uh, less huge decisions where principles of decision-making can helpfully be explored that then can be applied to the sort of next-step decision that you find yourself facing. So do go and have a listen to them, whether you're a woman or a man. And then Melissa Kruger, again, very helpful and sensible on this issue of discernment. What is it that we're talking about it? And how do I get enough to take that next step, whatever the options are that are in front of me as I consider the next step? In this little session together, I want to turn over and just to, to as a signpost, offer to you a couple of further things I think may be helpful. Doug Wilson's interview is well worth uh, spending time with, just uh, seven minutes for that. But he says, do you have a reading list for someone seeking the call? He has a good discussion uh, of what that might mean. What is a call? And his reading list is sensible. I put it there for you uh, on, the, uh, on the handout. I want to do something for a moment with the, uh, the, the joy of numbers. Um, a five-step process for making decisions, a six-step process, a seven-step process, ten biblical principles. Once you've been around a little while and you've seen different sets of numbers, you start to wonder about the value of the whole idea of trying to identify those numbers. Most youth ministries need to come up with a few numbers to help people make decisions, but you'll see that the arbitrary character of the numbers suggests that numbers might not be the most appropriate way to go. And taking us away from numbers, at the bottom of that uh, uh, part of the handout on page four at the bottom, I put a little headline called The Neglect of Wisdom. And I do think that's a feature of some of our churches. If I say to you, in a discipleship program, what part did Proverbs play in training you as a Christian? Or if I say, what part did the wisdom literature as a whole, Ecclesiastes and Job, Song of Songs, play in training you to seek God's wisdom? In some contexts, the answer is, oh, yeah, yeah, we're very familiar with that material. But in others, is no, we haven't really thought about that as to how do we seek out God's wisdom and how do we find God's wisdom. And uh, from Alistair Roberts, there's a very helpful discussion from just a few months ago on what wisdom might look like in the land of COVID that we're all in at the moment. But I think it'd be helpful for the sort of decision that you're thinking about making as well to recognize that there are boundaries around decisions that we need to make in some areas of life. But within those boundaries, God has provided us in his word with resources that lead us towards the wisdom that comes from heaven, as James describes it, that we do need to seek and identify as we go along. I'm going to pause there for a moment, and we'll come to some more questions from you 
and then we'll go back to me again. Thank you. Um, a couple on this, this issue of secular, which we understand is in inverted commas, uh, versus gospel ministry. Uh, one question, in a secular job, in inverted commas, is the only slash main opportunity for gospel ministry evangelism? Or is opportunity for godliness slash giving glory to God, um, for example, through being a Christian medic, giving good medical um, treatment of equal worth? Hmm. I think Richard was talking earlier, wasn't he? And I wasn't here to hear him talk, but somebody mentioned to me that Richard was talking about, uh, if you like, creation opportunities and new creation opportunities. And I, I, I kind of wouldn't want to pitch them against each other, although it is sensible, it seems to me, to prioritize one over the other. So is what God gives to ordinary Christians to do for most of their time around the world, through most of human history and most cultures, a waste of time? Well, clearly not. And does God do not care about what Christians do with their time and with the character that they take with them to work, whether they're farming or whether they're uh, doing accounting or whether they're designing websites? Uh, no, clearly not. God gives to his people responsibility to be filling the world, subduing it, and, and working for his glory, both when the church is gathered, but also when Christians are scattered. Thank you. I mean, the next one sort of follows on from that, but perhaps sort of going to a little bit more practically, how do we weigh up the value of the opportunities provided by a secular vocation versus entering full-time ministry? So I guess I might look at it and see I've got these opportunities here. How do we even kind of begin to yeah. assess that? I think the first little video we watched at said that's not easy, and I don't think it is. I think one trap, for example, that you can see some people in some context where they've got a, a, a job, where they're, for example, working here in London, they're rising in responsibility in the setting where they're working, and they're kind of holding their breath for when they get to the top of the pile, then they know they'll have spiritual opportunities to shape the culture of the organization around them. I think that's always a mistake. We need to calculate the opportunities today as far as we're mm. able to, rather than wait mm. for tomorrow. Mm. I, I think it's easy, if I can put it this way around, to underestimate the opportunities that there are by staying where you are mm. and to overestimate the opportunities of switching into a, a denominational structure of one kind or another that will bring with it quite a lot of opportunities, but also quite a lot of constraints. Mm. Um, mm. A little bit like mm. that church building next to the flood in the uh, first part of our handout. It's easy, in a sense, to get mm. locked inside a structure, whereas mm. in another context, you might have more freedom to maneuver. Mm. I'm just on a very, this is a very specific one. Um, if um, someone's talking about the one to one discipleship, so if one-to-one -one discipleship is your passion, would this actually be better suited in the workplace than, say, if your passions or giftings were preaching slash teaching? It could be. That's a good, that's a good short answer. Thank you. Um, another quick question, um, but again, a very practical one. How much time should someone consider, someone considering gospel ministry spend reading each week? I mean, I guess it depends on your reading speed, but um, any, any sort of pointers on that? You obviously read a great deal. As much as you can. Thank you. I think we'll hand you back. Okay, thanks very much. So again, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And we pray that he'll so work in us that we may be shaped like him and willing not to, to be served, but to serve. And we pray that may be the character of our life in whatever role or responsibilities or context or culture that he sets us. And we ask it for the honor of his name. Amen. Another really very familiar passage, but it seems to me critical. And um, uh, uh, in a leadership module at Oak Hill recently, uh, we've spent effectively 12 weeks looking, 
coming back to this passage, so 48 hours of time, coming to this passage and go, going away elsewhere and then coming back here again and again and found it thoroughly worthwhile. So in Mark 10, you know these verses, Jesus called them together, that's his followers, and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You see what he is encouraging them to do? He talks about what they know. He says, you know. Well, what do they know? They know that what patterns of leadership uh, in the world around them have a particular shape to them. If there are two people in the room trying to decide where to go for a walk, one of us needs to lead. So leadership is a function of being human. So the point of comparison in, in, in the mind of Jesus as he, as he looks out there is not that leadership is wrong or, or unnecessary, it's thoroughly necessary, but he looks out and sees things that do go wrong, which is where Gentiles uh, who are leaders lord it over those who are being led by them. And the way in which high officials exercise authority of those who are accountable to them. And as he talks to his followers, in this stage, he's called them to him, but they're not sort of public leaders in any kind of way. This is part of Christian living before it's part of uh, leadership. He, he says to them, no, 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 not, not, not like you. Basic Christianity involves being willing to, not to be served, but to serve. And so that's going to be a really basic in ingredient in terms of the sort of decision that is facing if you're wondering about stepping further into Christian ministry. Are you willing to step lower? If, if Christianity, in other contexts, he, he talks to people and says to people um, to come after him to take up their cross. Christi Christian living is a form of dying. Christian leadership, Christian ministry, is in a sense an accelerated form of dying. And is that something you're willing to decide to hold up your hand for? That's an important aspect of the decision that is facing you. And Jesus is absolutely clear about it. So let's think a little more about the dynamics of decision-making together. Um, I was struck by a, a student uh, writing uh, earlier in the uh, last summer, uh, and he, he said this. He said, we'd weighed all the options. This was to do with camp in COVID. And having weighed the options, he said, I, I found myself at a loss to know what to do when it came to making the actual decision. Well, at least he got as far as the options. Let's have a quick look at a, at a graphic on the screen uh, uh, for the next two moments or so. There is a very straight forward way of making decisions as you identify, well, what is the decision I'm trying to make? You gather information about trying to make the decision, you identify alternatives, you weigh the evidence between the alternatives, and then you choose between the alternatives, and then you take action, then you review the decision that you've made afterwards. Now, you could use a kind of pattern for decision making like that to decide what sort of takeaway to buy. Or, or what book you're going to read next, or where to go on holiday, a whole range of areas of life. A straightforward pattern for decision-making like this might be helpful. And it would be foolish to ignore the usefulness of something like this as you identify your next steps. And in some ways, it seems to me, it's, it's helpful to articulate the process by which you're going about making the decision and who is going to help you at each step along the way. You could choose a different framework. I offer it to you so that you can think about the framework you're already using for making this kind of decision. I put some other resources there on the outline for you. I want to think for a moment again about women as well as men making these decisions. And I flagged up for you, again, we're coming back to Alistair Roberts, and there's a link to a very valuable article from him thinking about dominion. If God gives dominion to men and women working together alongside each other within his creation, does the experience of dominion, if you're a woman or if you're a man, necessarily follow that it's going to be the same? And that's not a conversation we have very often. It's not a way of articulating the issues that we think about very often. But Alistair Roberts's material is really helpful, thoughtful, going right back to Genesis and thinking from there is there something about the bit of dominion that God has given to women and given to men 
means that our experience of what it means to share in dominion will be slightly different or profoundly different from one another. And, and that's a decision that God has made for us that we can enter into. I do suggest that you spend some time thinking about that. Another area where I've got some reading, which I hope will be helpful for women thinking about these decisions, as well as for men, is to pick up the experience of somebody who serves in uh, the Palestinian Evangelical Church. I came across these resources uh, some time ago. She wrote a little thesis about what she sees. And I want to underline what she is wrestling with. And, and you don't have to agree with her at all as you read through what she does about what she sees to recognize the reality of the issue that she is wrestling with. So what she sees in the light of Mark 10 is very clearly how in the world around her, if you like, there are, there are some aspects of behavior from men towards women uh, that, that, if you like, reflect sort of lording it over each other in ways that are unhelpful. Although in some ways, the world is more free of this than some aspects of the church. But then she sees that those patterns of behavior are present in churches that she cares deeply about. And she wants to try to do something about that. The training of women to become uh, leaders, take on responsibility for leadership in a variety of different roles in ways that might change the culture. And I suggest that to go for, if you like, on a journey to read what she sees and what she says about it would be helpful. Again, please, uh, please know you don't need to agree with her but it'd be very useful to travel alongside her and see what she sees and see whether that resonates with what you see and what you might like to do around here. Now, again, let me be a signpost for you. At this point, the signpost has gone mad. You know the signpost by land's end. It points in all sorts of different directions at the same time. Um, I'm about to be one of those pointing in 10 different directions at the same time, offering you as much as 10 hours of different ways of going forwards in making a decision of this kind. Why do I do that? Well, because it may be quite a big decision. If you're at that uh, moment where you're thinking, shall I marry her or not? Would she say yes if I asked? You'd spend 10 hours thinking about that and talking to others and praying about it for sure. Uh, this is not quite such a big decision as that, but it is a big decision. Uh, and sometimes the, the cost is clear and the concerns, therefore, are, are for real. So here are, if you like, a number of areas where you could go that I think will be helpful for you in thinking about if you have a specific decision, what do I do next? Or do I stop doing this in order to do that? Uh, and, and here we go in a variety of different directions. I want to encourage you to think about bivocational ministry. And I want you to take the Apostle Paul as a really interesting example for thinking about bivocational ministry. It seems to me, and I've written it in this way in the handout, if we've been planning Paul's diary, we would have not have chosen for him to spend any time making tents. Why have an apostle who makes tents? And nor would we have filled into his diary any time for him to be in prison. Why put the one who is pointed by God to bring the gospel to the whole of the Mediterranean world in prison? How is he going to do that from there? And it seems to me that's a very helpful reminder to us that God knows more than we do and thinks differently from us. So take a look into, again, some brothers from across the water uh, in the States thinking about bivocational ministry, valuable opportunity to read and listen and think. Uh, and if the task is to evangelize the country uh, as it is now back here with the gospel of the Lord Jesus, how could we do that through existing infrastructure? And you'll see a suggestion there. And I want to encourage you to spend time in Titus and to think about Crete and uh, you saw David Suchet on the uh, Kill Little uh, clip earlier, and uh, he reads so well. Why not listen to him reading about Crete? And then uh, the Little Bible Project clip, if you come across those, it's a valuable resource in most instances. Uh, have a look at that, and then read Titus yourself, and then see where you might fit into a story like the one that is going on, as Titus is a commissioned by Paul to find people who are suitable, to take on the role of elder to build up the churches and evangelize the island. And uh, if you want to put your hand up for that under God, and you're encouraged to do so by others, that'd be a good place to go. Think about that. I also think it's really helpful to benchmark our own thinking by thinking that, uh, and patterns of, uh, of deploying people and developing people and the needs that churches face in other cultures. And I put together something from a study on African leadership and qualities of Christian leaders in Africa, African cultures. It's a helpful survey. Go have a look. 
and then come back to here in the light of what you see. I think the language of metaphor, again, I used that language earlier, is helpful in thinking in this area. Are you wanting to be a GP or a, a classroom assistant or a multi-site head teacher? Or are you part of a disaster relief fund? But turning to scripture and metaphor, you will see the language of servant, shepherd, soldier, athlete uh, appearing in the passages I've suggested. That will play into your decision making. Are you able to say, Lord, yes, please, to those different roles? Again, to spotlight on experiences that women have in cultures across the world and in churches across the world, a collection, two collections of essays showing some of the challenges that women face in other parts of the world have been, again, helpful for here. Have you talked to your parents? If you have parents who are living, have you talked to them? They know you better than anybody else. To spend an hour listening to them, would they would appreciate that, whether they agree or support or identify with either your faith or the decision that you're contemplating. Again, you'll notice if you read the pastorals as you think about this issue that very often the reputation of the church in the world is an important ingredient of what um, the apostle is establishing or defending and again, if you're in work uh, or you, you have friends who share sport with you or live next door to you, no, you're do not Christian, don't share your faith. Could you sit down with one of them, obviously outside COVID land, sit down with one of them and say, well, I'm thinking of this. What, what, what do you want to say to me? What, what do you think about that? And to see whether in the eyes of someone who knows you, well, you could commend the gospel of the Lord Jesus to them if you took on this kind of role. Training pathways we've talked about a bit. I think we ought to want to say that at Oak Hill we believe that the, uh, if you like, the demands of ministry are so deep and so broad that training needs to be deep enough and broad enough to develop the character and the convictions and the kind of competencies that match the scale and depth of the task. We're at an interesting time denominationally. There are all sorts of different groups of churches uh, in all kinds of cultures and all kinds of settings. They're shifting and changing a bit at the moment. Again, I think it's important to, to think about not just you personally, but where do you want to land? What kind of community or cluster of churches do you want to serve in beyond any kind of training that might be ahead of you? And not just now, but over the next five or 10 or 20 years, if you think you can see that far ahead are you going to in a sense go down a dead end or are you going to have to switch from one to another or, or what but to have a serious conversation about that with someone who can help you I think would be sensible and then before we come to a question I, I do think it's important to go back to that night before Jesus died and look again at what he does with the towel and the bowl and then to listen to what he says about that he says what he has just done. It's not only, if you like, an acted parable in advance of what he's about to do on the cross, but it's the pattern for all Christian living. It's the pattern for all Christian ministry. And so one of the decisions that you're facing, and a vital aspect of the decision you're facing is, are you up for that? Is that the kind of life, by his grace, that you want him to equip you to live? Now for a question or two. Thank you very much, Johnny. Um, question that's just come in. Um, even if a certain career path may not be inherently sinful, could going towards a vocation be sinful if God appears to have granted you wisdom into why you should go in a certain direction? So I think he's saying is a, a, a left-right decision turns into a sin and righteousness decision. Is it possible for the wisdom category to then sort of drift into a sin a right wrong decision because God has made it so clear that you should go down a particular path. It's really hard to answer that without knowing you and knowing the situation that you are facing. I suppose one situation I can think of in the book of Acts where there was a door that was open for what looked like gospel ministry and looked like it would be fruitful, no reason to think it wouldn't be, but at that moment, they came to a conviction they shouldn't go through it. And I, I guess when you're looking at this in terms of are you drifting, drifting is not the word I would use, are you staying where you are, discerning that it's wise to remain where you are? 
if you're seeking God's discernment and wisdom, you can trust him to give it to you mm. rather than leading you, mm. drifting along in a direction that's becoming sinful. The Holy Spirit will convict mm. you of sin if you are mm. sinning in that mm. instance. Yeah, thank you. Um, a very uh, real one. How do you work out what decision to make when the advice and counsel from leaders and older believers is very varied? Uh, it seems to be pointing you in all sorts of different directions. Take your time. The uh, varied device, advice may, may clarify. It may not. But in the end, the responsibility for whatever decision you decide to make is yours and not theirs. And the advice that they're trying to give you is to enable you to make the decision under God, not to take away your responsibility to make your own decision. Don't let anyone ever do that to you. Mm, thank you. Um, so I'm talking about specifically, if, if you're still at university, how could you best use that time to work out whether you are being, this is called, I think, sort of being led into gospel work? In COVID land, that's quite tricky. Again, I think I'd want to encourage you to talk to the church leader in the context in which you find yourself and look for opportunities to serve and to serve in all kinds of different settings, whether that's among those who are older, who might appreciate time with you and a, a word, um, you sharing the word of God with them or with those who are younger. Look for very ordinary ways in which you can serve and then go back to the church leader. Does that make your heart sing? Do the people who hear you do that want you to do it again or would they rather you didn't? Uh, in other words, you can, you, can, you can seek to serve and then mm. build on the opportunities to serve that are already present for you. Mm. I think you're starting to answer the, 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 the next question actually, which is that should a role that we think uh, we may be called to influence our pathway into it, or should we use the training pathways to discern what our role should be? So uh, e.g. taking a more trainee position uh, going beyond a, a, an apprenticeship. I think the question is, um, yeah, do I think, I, I think this is where I should be getting to, I, I try and move to go there, or I'm already going this way, do I use that as an opportunity to find out where I should go? Again, it's not straightforward to give advice to supply in every context, but for many years, when, when, when I'm kind of trying to work out what to do and we're approached by somebody else to do something different, my own response was, you can pray, and if I can't sleep, I'll let you know, but don't hold your breath. And I found that quite helpful in the sense that where God had put me was where I was going to stay unless there was an obvious reason to move somewhere else. Mm, mm. And I think that plays back into this situation. If mm. you are where you are, stay where you mm. are until it mm. becomes plain and clear that somewhere next is what God has in mind for you. Mm. Thank you. I was praying to, for a kind of a restlessness spiritually that I would know that next was going to become appropriate. Sure, thank you. I guess linked to that then, motivations. How can we be, how can we be clear about our motivations for decisions given how deceitful our hearts are? You can't. I think Santos started to, to talk about this uh, yesterday. Um, and I, th I think just, just one more, um, in terms of if uh, someone's saying that they do feel through this conference that they are perhaps um, they, they do seriously need to explore, um, particularly, it talks vocational ministry, I think they mean sort of pastoral yeah, yeah. ministry. Um, I mean, there's lots of different sorts of ministries we've been talking about through the last few days and you've talked about, but specifically that sort of, I guess, pastor teacher type role, yeah. what might be good next steps to think through there? Pray, asking the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. Make that something that you commit to. Look for opportunities to serve him in the part of the harvest field where you already are. So look for opportunities to build up other believers and to reach out into the, into the relationships that you have with the gospel and see what happens as you do that. Mm. And bring the, 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 the growing sense of that desire to the church leader, or to the church context in which you find yourself so that as a growing desire is, is there and present and, and, and persists, it can be tested and affirmed and you can receive advice on what to do next beyond that. Mm. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, really appreciated you teaching us. Uh, thank you for signposting loads and loads of really helpful resources. Um, do take that, um, 
that handout away and really mine it. I think that would be a great next step to, as, as Johnny said, there's hours of video material there, there's podcasts, there's articles. Really dig into those. Uh, there's loads and loads of wisdom in there. So that would be a great next step to pursue. It, it seems appropriate for me to, to close this session by praying. Um, this is a ministry of prayer and the word. So let me, let me pray as uh, Johnny's encouraged us to pray for workers for the harvest field. Let's pray. Um, Lord God, we um, praise you and thank you that you are a, a Lord who has uh, this immense compassion for lost, sinful, uh, God-hating, and naturally God-hating people like us. You, you run after us, you save us in the Lord Jesus at the, the most incredible cost. Um, and thank you that, that there is a harvest. Thank you that, that we are part of that. And we do pray, as you asked your your workers who you're sending out into the harvest field, you ask them to pray for more workers to be sent out in the harvest field. We do pray that you would do that. We see that that is a complex thing, that, that the way you send it is uh, not always simple, that it, that it involves processes of decision-making, of seeking the wisdom and counsel of others, that it, that it involves um, perhaps not the most strategic route as we would see it. You're happy to put Paul in prison. You're happy for... Um, uh, the, the stuff that's going on in the world at the moment that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have planned at all, and yet you're using that in different ways to to bring glory to Jesus of opening different doors to the ones we expected. So we pray that you would be leading each one of us. We pray that you would raise up workers for your harvest field, that there that the harvest would come in, that people from every nation would be gathered to your Son to find safety and joy in Him. Uh, we pray that in His name. Amen. Amen.